Hear ye, hear ye. It is 6 p.m. on Tuesday, September 5th, 2023. I will call this meeting of the Miami Township Montgomery County Board of Trustees to order. If everybody could please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Klingerman will hold on the roll call. As uh, those of you may be viewing online can see, I am the only trustee in the, in the meeting at this time. We do expect one of the other trustees to possibly show up momentarily. So we're going to proceed with the parts of the agenda that can be done that do not need to be voted upon by the other trustees. Chief Stegelmeyer, reading of casualties. Good evening, board. The following is the list of the first responder casualties for the period of August 24th through September the 5th of 2023. Police Officer Anthony Francone, Pyramid Lake Tribal Police Department in Nevada. End of watch, August 25th, 2023. Fire Battalion Chief Terryson Jackson, the Broward County Sheriff's Office Department of Fire Rescue and Emergency Services, Florida. End of watch, August 28th, 2023. Fire Lieutenant Kevin Ward, Chicago Fire Department in Illinois. End of watch, August 28th, 2023. Sheriff Robert Rogers, Wilcox County Sheriff's Office, Georgia. End of watch, August 29th, 2023. Deputy Sheriff Matthew Pearson, the Shelby County Sheriff's Office, Texas. End of watch, August 29th, 2023. And finally, K-9 Waro from the Clayton County Police Department in Georgia. End of watch, September 2nd, 2023. Everyone could please join me in recognizing a moment of silence. Thank you. So those who are watching online may be asking why we're starting and proceeding a meeting with uh, only one trustee. Well, we did advertise this meeting, so I believe that we are obligated to start the meeting on time. So we have started the meeting at 6 p.m. And as I said, we'll get through what we can without another trustee present. Uh, with that, we have a guest presentation, our own Mr. Clay McCord, to talk through a year-to-date budget update. Good evening, everybody. I uh, put together a few slides to kind of walk through where we are at uh, the halfway point, and I realize that's June 30th, but uh, this is the, one of the first of many updates to come uh, as we go through the rest of the year. Just real briefly, what I want to step through is just uh, some graphs that show the general fund uh, of the township as a year-to-date actual compared to full-year budget totals for the last three years, and then the first slide will, will give you kind of a visual representation of where all the different revenue streams come from. And then I'll, boy, I'll, we'll zoom in on a couple of things just to look at what's going on and how we're trending. Do the same thing uh, with the other revenue sources of the township that are not general fund, that are usually levy funds or some other restricted revenue stream where there are some restrictions on how we can spend that money um, on different activities. And we'll do a similar exercise with the, expense, with the expenses, general fund, and the special revenues as well. So this first graph didn't update. What? It's not updating. The screen is. So this first graph shows you on the far left side all of the balance in the general fund, the total for all of those revenue streams that are spread out to the right of that, property, uh, property and other local taxes, charges for services, et cetera. This kind of gives you an idea of where the main revenue streams coming into the general, general fund are coming from. The column marked 45 intergovernmental, those would be reimbursements coming in from the state 
or other payments uh, from other jurisdictions, uh, in this case, our joint economic development districts that the township participates in is a part of those totals as well. Oh, wait, let me back up. One bright note, very bright note. If you look in the column marked 47, earnings on investments, if you look at the green columns, which represent 2023 budgeted uh, expected revenue and actual year-to-date revenue as of June 30th, we exceeded what we had anticipated for the full year. And uh, looking forward into August, that number has not quite doubled since August as well, thanks in part to the um, short-term market uh, where star investment's doing quite well. So in looking at these graphs, the, the graphs you have labeled uh, expected revenue, that's expected revenue for the 12-month period. For the 12-month period, that's correct. And the actuals are through a six-month period. Correct. Thank you. The, yeah, we were, because our revenue streams are somewhat sporadic in that, like, we have property tax settlement twice a year, we don't use the expected, we don't use the, um, there's a feature within the system that'll allow us to spread that income, that expected income over 12 months, and it'll increment, it could match it, but it would not be reflective, meaningful for us at this point in the year. So what I did here is I pulled out some of the larger elements just to kind of show how we were doing, and I think this gives you a better visual representation of where we are compared to 22 and 2021. Um, I wish I could say there's been a normal year, but in the last four, I don't think we've had what's been a really a truly normal year, so this is just comparing post-pandemic years. Um, trying to think there's really property tax collections are up slightly that's reflective mainly of the adjusted um, now this is just in general funds so this is just the rise in values this does not include any of the voted millage uh, funds levy funds that are out there um, and as you can see the expected growth um, on the inter intergovernmental what you see right now in the June as of June 30th two of the three actually all three of the the JEDs have not executed their discretionary disbursement, which is expected in um, third quarter, but prior to the end of the year. But all three have committed to uh, remitting 1.74 million back to the township. So that budget number is pretty, pretty solid. Any questions on revenue sources from, for the general fund? So it appears we're tracking year over year the same place we were in 2022 with regards to the general fund, but we had a significant increase in expectations. Is there a single event that led us to believe we were going to get an increase of 500,000 over last year, full year? Um, the intergovernment from the JED increases were there, and the um, rebound in the occupancy tax would also uh, be attributed to that that would be um, offset, well, yes, because we upped our earnings on, in, on investments, we upped it, we just didn't up it enough. We knew rates were rising, but we didn't anticipate them rising quite as much as they did. So we'll revisit this on a month-to-month -month basis throughout the rest of the year to see if there's any adjustments. <clears throat> there may be some need to adjust toward the end of the fourth quarter. Um, We'll so is this, is this column one a summary of all these other columns, or are they all independent? Of all, all of the columns you see in the first add up, those totals, that's for the entire amount for, uh, in the general fund. But all I did here was just make those a little bit bigger, the more significant ones. Okay, so on that first graph we saw, saw there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different graphs added together equal the number one. Correct. Thank you. Correct. And the similar structure here with the special revenue funds, which would be the, for those of you that look at the, the um, cash reconciliation, these are the funds that in the 200 series. Um, what you see in property and other local taxes would be our voted millage, police, and fire levy in the, in the prior year. So that's why you see a dip in the green columns for 2023 would be the expiration of the fire levies reflected there. Um, the other piece that flows into this would be the, pilot, uh, the payments in lieu of other taxes that are generated through the TIF districts. 
Those come in under column 48, miscellaneous and pilots. Um, government accounting standards won't allow us to put that into property taxes, even though they are a substitute property tax like vehicle. The other item of note, looking back in history, if you look at the 2021 columns, there's, it looks as though, if you at first blush, when you look at that, it looks like we're down quite a bit on special revenue, special revenue funds receipts. 2021 was the last year we did a bond refunding. And so when you look out in column 49, uh, financial ser the financing services, that is the revenue that was recognized on the books for the refunding. So that $8 million is, is adding into that $31 million for that one year, but there was a corresponding expense on, on the other side to offset that. So it wasn't though we had a, a windfall of $8 million that year, it was just uh, clearing that off of the books through the accounting process. So similar to before, I go back in this column and just in this slide, just go back and bring out the bigger pieces, the more meaningful pieces that are leading into the special revenues, and this includes all of them. So this is uh, police levy, this is the fire levies in years past, this is gas tax, motor vehicle tax, all of that. Those are all, those are reflected in column 41, pilots, and other, those are the, these are the big main hitters in the special revenues. So that's kind of it for revenues. Any, any questions on what's coming in the door? The ARP funds are also reflected in here, correct? Yes. The one-time receipt of yes. those? Yes, those would have been part of, those would have been a part of these revenues. So when you're looking at 2022 and 2023, no, sorry, 21 and 22. So a million and a half in each of those is attributed to ARP. <coughs> so similar to the, the structure that I employed for the revenue, we did the same thing with the expenses. We broke out first general fund and the different categories uh, that we have on the financial statements that, that support that. And you can see the first, it's kind of ordered in, in magnitude of importance, but this is just the order. Um, salaries, benefits, purchase services are the three major categories, with the others, the other spending categories being somewhat uh, subdued compared to those. Um, let's see, here we go. Broke out just a little bit bigger view of those, and I added consumables just to kind of pair off. That's where the bulk of our spending um, resides in these categories outside of debt service uh, for the township as a whole, and those don't generally come out of general fund. The only debt being serviced right now out of the general fund is on this building. And nothing spectacular. I mean, we're still tracking. Uh, there'll be some adjustment as we go through just in the normal business of things that we weren't able to uh, execute on or we had to adjust down. So I don't expect what we have right now projected for 2023 spend. I don't expect to meet that. Uh, we typically will go back and do an adjustment in November, December, uh, in preparation for final year end, where we'll bring those numbers back down because of plans that we had at the beginning of the year that we weren't able to execute on, and we just go back and update our records with, within the accounting system and with the county monitor. And this is special revenue, kind of a look at that. This shows you the impact of debt services. Um, they're coming out primarily out of the TIF districts so those principal payments come out in November. So they, they sit out there and we run, we look like we're running um, even better than expected. I have to always remind everybody, we've got multiple figures coming out in November uh, that impact uh, total spend. But this gives you at least just a visual representation. If you add up all of the blue chart, all of the blue stacks, they're gonna look equal to the two on the far left. Again, that's all of the expenses. Uh, for the year, so overall our spending is, is trending down at this level, but it's, we're not doing a refinancing. We've eliminated the payments um, to the fire district and the, ex the expiration of the, the levies as well. And here's just a larger view, a better, more clear view of what's going on. And 
the impact of debt service, which is still moderate uh, for a township of our size. So I will pause there for any questions. I think, uh, Clay, when we were discussing the numbers, it's worth mentioning about the employee benefits in our insurance and kind of indicating to everyone here what those dollars were, how the percentage that we talked about, how that went up versus last year and so on. Yes, and if you look, actually, if you look at this, if you look at this graph, there, there's a slight uptick almost to where we were um, in 2021. And these numbers, these budget numbers were put together prior to the renewal um, of our health care uh, kind of, we didn't know what that renewal was going to look like. So we budgeted a 15% increase for the year and we came in just under 15. So I, I don't anticipate there being a need to adjust employee benefits, uh, medical and uh, health care insurance rates for calendar physical 23. We will be revisiting and looking hard at what our projection and our assumptions are going to be going into 24. And I would venture to guess it's going to be somewhat a little bit higher just based on what trending. But we're going to work with our partners at McGowan and kind of look at what the market on our own, look at the market, see what's going on to come up with a more meaningful and across the, you know, we'll apply that across the board consistently. And I think it's worth mentioning too the fact of our projections matching reality in terms of those percentages, if you might bring that up. That, that is true. We have, we have traditionally have, have held fast to the 15% rule year over year, and we've been very successful in the past at keeping those costs at or below. In fact, we've had a couple of years that were negative. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was always, with a caveat, always put in there, you know, this is, we could be, you know, we have, we're one year away. And um, our collective usage in the past in calendar 22 or policy year 22 uh, 23 put us in a position where the carriers wanted a little bit more in return for what we were what we were buying. So, um, not happy about it. But at the same time, when I look at other jurisdictions that are in the 30, 40 percent range, I'm I'm encouraged by the, the activities of, of the employees and the participants in the health plans to keep those costs down. Yeah, that was something we ex discussed extensively and smaller sessions, the average increase for all industries was closer to 16 to 18%. So mm -hmm. uh, kudos to the team for uh, holding us under the national average. And I think it's also important to note when we're talking about benefits, benefits are, are one of the primary reasons why you were able to keep your employees. Um, and to have a good, strong benefits package is something that we're always going to try to maintain here at the township. Uh, we, like many folks, are struggling to find new workers, uh, and there's a lot of poaching going on in all industries. The bigger fish are eating the smaller fish, and we've had our fair share of turnover, have we not, Mr. Carlson? So we are working hard to diligently keep our, our team fully staffed to provide the services required and uh, deserving of the citizens of Miami Township. All right, well, that's all I have. All right, any other questions for Mr. McCord, from anyone? Mr. Klingerman, any comments? Uh, no, we did a, a debrief earlier about uh, the numbers and so forth, and, and they're pretty in line. I think one point uh, worth mentioning is the overall projection of the percentage. I think it was 51% of what we projected for the first six months. Wasn't that the number? Actually, the first six months was actually just under 41% uh, through August 31st. I ran this. I've, I've set up a repeatable grid so I can pull information off. We're, we haven't quite closed August yet, but I wanted to kind of look at the projection. And so the numbers that I, I shared with Mr. Klingerman were the projected ending balances for, for August, and it showed our overall um, expense to budget uh, for August 31st to be about 51.2, I think, 51, just over 51% for the year. Um, Given that we have those debt payments that are looming out in November, but the first half of the year we only pay interest the way the bonds are set up, and the principal payment and the second half of the interest for the year comes due in um, 
various times in the month of November primarily. And so that will catch us up. You know, we'll, we'll be trending ahead for 11 months and then in, we'll, we'll, we'll true up in December because all of that will come in at the, you know, toward the end of the November 30th numbers. But um, to be under, significantly under 50% at mid-year is, is encouraging and a testament to the, the department heads, you know, watching every dollar and making sure that we're not um, wasting anything. So, thank you. Excellent, very good. Right. Thank you, Mr. McCord. All right, going back to the agenda, we are not doing a roll call and hope that another trustee will arrive. We uh, cannot make a motion on the consent agenda. I will move into new business and I believe we can take reports on these items because they were already presented in our packets. Each of the trustees were given time to study them. So, Charlie Stegelmeyer, motion for liquor permit. Yes, board. In your packets, it was a application for a new liquor permit, a new C2 liquor permit, and this is from um, Aldi and Corporate of Ohio doing business as Aldi number 76, located at 2619 Miamisburg Centerville Road here in Miami Township. We find no reason to contest this uh, request for a new permit, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Just to update the board, the C2 licenses for wine and mixed beverages and sealed containers for carryout only. So does every grocery store have to have a liquor permit or does this particular liquor permit give this particular store the opportunity to do something other cannot do? Any establishment that sells liquor in the state of Ohio has to have a permit by the Liquor Commission in order to sell alcohol legally. Very good. Thank you. You also have resolution 71-2023. It's you. Oh, <laughs> I apologize, board. 71, resolution to amend appropriation funds for 2023. Board, this is just to add some uh, money to my vehicle maintenance uh, account. Uh, as uh, Director Swikert talked to you earlier, I think in his last reappropriation, uh, with the new vehicle maintenance uh, division that we've established here at the township, it was we knew that we were going to have some wiggle room and some uh, amendments we're going to have to do regarding how much money we needed to have in these accounts. And uh, I'm requesting a $30,000 transfer just to carry me through the end of the year, just to be sure we have enough in the account. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. I have no questions. Mr. Schweikert, you have resolution 72. Good evening, board. In your packet, we uh, typically do a fall audit of inventory and go through equipment and uh, just miscellaneous items and see what's uh, broken or need to, that was replaced and this is just a, a declaration of these equipments that we would like to uh, uh, dispose of and I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding this resolution. Hearing none, Mr. Snyder you have uh, resolution 75 and 76. Uh, good evening. Uh, we do have an amendment uh, to a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, this was previously discussed in executive session. Uh, this is an agreement between the Miami Township and the union representing the sergeants and lieutenants at the uh, police department. So um, you do have information in your packets uh, regarding that modification. So um, the final resolution 76 2023 is a resolution to engage a consultant. Um, again, as we continually uh, work to improve our organization, we are seeking authorization to engage a consultant. Uh, this particular consultant has expertise in counseling and training on, an on a variety of employee-related matters, uh, particularly regarding recruitment and retention. So, to your point earlier, that is all I have. If there are any questions. I have no questions. I will commend the administration on looking into this. Uh, we want to keep a pulse on the, the uh, satisfaction of our employees and bringing in a third party. Oftentimes, uh, I can share that when I was a economics professor at the University of Cincinnati and I went into classrooms to give presentations on some basic economic principles in high schools, uh, frequently the instructor afterwards would say, thank you very much for coming. 
you didn't really say anything that I haven't said before, but coming from you, they, they listen to it differently and it provides some credibility for me as well. So I think sometimes bringing in that exterior consultant is, uh, is a misunderstanding for the community on why that provides value to uh, a lot of times people will open up and ask questions of somebody that's not their direct supervisor or uh, an administrator. So I think this was a, a good use of funds and hopefully we'll get another trustee, trustee here someday and we'll vote on it. All right, uh, we will move to the public comment portion of the meeting and seeing no members of the public in the general audience and we have no way to interact with those who may be watching online, I will open and close the public comment period. We cannot consider votes of resolutions and motions with a single vote. We cannot open a public hearing with a single vote. Department head comments. Chief, back to you. You don't have any good stories to tell or something to <laughs> buy us some time? <laughs> Mr. Schweikert. I can come up with something. There we go. <laughs> Just real quick, we're heading into the fall season. We are going to uh, most likely be starting the leaf collection the very end of October. So um, something different this year is we'll be providing daily updates on the website under the leaf collection tab. I believe that's under public works. So uh, residents should have a good idea when we'll be coming through. And uh, as in years past, it'll be multiple rounds. And uh, we look forward to serving the community this fall. Yeah, that's a great idea. I appreciate the the uh, department coming up with those daily updates. Are we going to find a way to get this advertised out I mean, one of our e-newsletters, get past the word in yeah. advance of October? It'll be in the e-newsletter. Uh, it'll also be on our social media, um, but we will be rolling out uh, many updates and just look forward to giving uh, residents ample time to know when they'll be coming through that, that section, when they'll be coming back. It's a good gauge. Um, so maybe if you miss raking your leaves out this Thursday or what it, whatever that would be, you know they're going to come back in a few days. So, Well, and in reading the latest edition of the Miamisburg West Carrollton News, they put a nice article uh, highlighting our stocking up of winter salt. So maybe Mr. Cummings or Mr. Weaver will cover this, uh, this opportunity and we'll get a, another nice article talking about this opportunity to find that information on our website. I'd be happy to talk to him. Mr. Carlson. Come on, this is story time. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Mr. McCord. I've had my say tonight. I don't have anything further. All right. Mr. Schneider. Well, since we have some time, it appears. Um, I will note uh, we are, again, holding the annual Veterans Breakfast. Uh, for those of you who have uh, served in the U.S. military um, and veterans and your family, uh, you're welcome to attend the Veterans Breakfast uh, to be held this year for the first time at Austin Landing at the Hilton Garden Inn. That will be on Thursday, November 9th. Uh, we will have information on our website and we'll be putting more information out, uh, particularly in October, uh, to invite uh, folks to attend that event. So if, again, you know of anyone or um, think there are folks that we need to reach out to, let us know. Um, also, electric aggregation I did receive a request just recently um, regarding somebody who was interested again in electric aggregation. They'd seen that the city of Miamisburg was uh, entering into an electric aggregation agreement, uh, and I was happy to note for them that we have already done that. Um, but as people do move into the township um, or come off of their contracts, uh, certainly they should reach out to Trouble Energy and Energy Harbor, who is our electric um, who our electric aggregation agreement is with um, to see if they now qualify to uh, come under that contract. So uh, there are phone numbers on our website, again, under the electric aggregation page uh, if you're interested in uh, finding out more information about that. So also, I do want to congratulate our community development director, Mr. Carlson, uh, for recently having um, completed quite a bit of work to uh, obtain an ODOT grant for streetscape improvements on Kings Ridge Drive. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that briefly, the amount and uh, timeline maybe, Mr. Carlson, on when 
we might expect to see some of those improvements. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Um, yeah, this is an exciting project. Uh, Kings Ridge Drive has uh, long been the topic of uh, specific area planning conversations at the township level. Uh, it's a very busy corridor within the township, over 8,000 average daily traffic. Uh, but you will notice that there are no sidewalks along Kings Ridge Drive. Uh, Kings Ridge Drive, again, uh, many small local businesses, service type businesses, restaurants, uh, would greatly benefit uh, from uh, the addition of sidewalks, uh, but more importantly, uh, the pedestrians will greatly benefit from the benefit of uh, new sidewalks. So uh, working with the Miami Crossing JED, uh, Miami Township submitted an application to ODOT uh, for safety funding, and we received one and a half million dollars uh, to go toward that project. So uh, we're very excited uh, for that. With that being said, uh, a lot of these state type programs, funding is released uh, a little bit later after uh, significant programming and engineering work. So uh, we won't see actual construction on the ground until likely 26 or, or, or fiscal year 2027. Um, but again, there's a lot of work to be done between now and then uh, and a little bit more funding to work on securing. But uh, that is a significant portion of the project cost. Uh, and we look forward to those improvements uh, and uh, making that a safer corridor that's, uh, again, improving the economics for the business owners as well. Well, thank you, and again, I appreciate uh, all the effort. A lot of these projects, I don't think uh, the public often realizes quite the timeline that it takes to line up some of these grants uh, to allow us to be able to leverage some of the other dollars that we have in the township from our, uh, our TIF programs, as well as the JEDs, and to be able to multiply uh, the impact that we <coughs> make those dollars have on the community. And uh, it is a long pipeline, uh, but we appreciate the work that uh, our department heads do to you know, establish those pipelines well in advance so that uh, as the years go by, uh, the public can begin to see some of these projects come to fruition. So thank you. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you for giving us that update. Um, I will add a comment on one topic you talked about on the aggregation issue. Again, uh, thanks to the administration for bringing us the capability as trustees to vote upon aggregation. Thanks to the voters for uh, voting to uh, allow the trustees to enter into aggregation agreements. As Mr. Snyder noted, we have entered into an agreement on the electrical side. Uh, we have not entered into an agreement on the gas side of the business. Um, we have yet to get a rate that the trustees felt was worthy of a long-term investment. We know a number of communities in the area have invested in rates, um, and some of them, in my opinion, are quite high. Uh, currently, the aggregation rate, or the, uh, the, uh, the rate that you'll charge if you're not in a contract through um, what used to be Vectrin, which is now Centerpoint Energy, is hovering around 32 cents. The best rate you can get currently online for a long-term agreement in the two to three year range is about 69 cents. So our residents are far better off not being in an aggregate agreement right now. Of course, it's summertime, it's 90 degrees out today and very little natural gas is being consumed for at least home heating. Um, but we still, are under, we still are working diligently to try to find a good long-term rate uh, and those rates continue to stay lower than projections, so uh, that's why we've not signed or entered into a natural gas rate at this time. Mr. Klingerman, any elected official comments? Uh, no stories to tell this evening. Well, how was your golf game this weekend? Uh, not as good as it should have been. So no comment on the <laughs> no golf No comment. Game. All right. Uh, we have no other elected officials other than myself, and I've made various comments during the meeting. Uh, we will not adjourn the meeting, but given no further business that can be done without a second trustee, I will uh, put the meeting on hold at 634. We will uh, go into, I guess, a recess in hopes that another trustee will arrive soon. It is 651. Mr. Don Culp has arrived. We can continue the meeting. We will start with the roll call. Mr. Morris. Here. Mr. Culp. Here. I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. 
I will make a motion to approve the liquor permit for Aldi. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 71-2023, a resolution to amend an appropriation of funds for 2023. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 72-2023, a resolution to declare surplus property and authorize the sale of said property. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 75-2023, a resolution to approve an amendment to an agreement. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 76-2023, a resolution to authorize the township administrator to engage a consultant. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. All right, we'll now move into the public hearing portion of the meeting. I will make a motion to open the public hearing for, well, I guess we don't have, we, are we opening up a meeting for the zoning resolution? There is no case number, is there? I will make a motion to open the zoning case 459-23. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. All right, this is the order in which this will proceed. Staff will give a report. Anyone in favor will give an opportunity to speak. Anybody opposed will be given an opportunity to speak. We will hold a time limit of three minutes on those, each of the speakers. If you come forward, give your name and address for the record. The board will close the public hearing prior to taking any final action. Mr. Carlson, have the legal requirements of this hearing been met? They have. Do you have a recommendation for the Miami Township Zoning Commission that you could review at this time? I do. Good evening, board. Before you tonight, zoning case 459-23 is an application to amend Article 19 of the Miami Township Zoning Resolution. This case was heard by the Zoning Commission uh, and was recommended for approval in a four to zero vote. Um, it's a, a pretty brief uh, amendment to the zoning text. Um, currently in the B3 Business District of Article 19, uh, automobile rental and lease is listed as a principal permitted use. Um, this is something today that many of our businesses uh, in or around the Dayton Mall are zoned in the B3 district. Uh, part of the challenge of that uh, in some of the more significant areas of open parking, that use could be converted today uh, where the entirety of a parking field theoretically could be used for uh, only vehicle storage. Um, looking then again, I'll, I'll kind of come back here in a moment, but. Uh, looking really at the intentions of the zoning district, uh, the B3 district is primarily for uh, commercial or retail trade conducted within an enclosed building uh, versus our B4 business district, uh, where that uh, sort of flips into outdoor conducted storage of retail merchandise. Uh, to take that then a step further, uh, any type of rental sales service uh, listed in the conditional use of uh, B4, so uh, where that's a principal permitted use in B3, uh, it's actually more intensively a conditional use in the B4 district. Uh, to be heard as a conditional use requires a number of uh, criteria to be met. Uh, so uh, currently, uh, the Zoning Commission voted uh, feeling that this use type is not a uh, great fit with the B3 business district to remove it from the B3 district. Um, there are two existing businesses that would be considered non-conforming uses as a result of this uh, text amendment, Avis mm. at the mall and Enterprise Renna Center uh, on Springboro Pike. Um, as is the case with our zoning resolution, uh, any non-conforming use, of course, is able to continue conducting as that use. They have a period of two years where they would have to cease operation before they could no longer continue use uh, of that use type. So. Again, these businesses could continue operating, they could sell their existing space uh, to a same type use, and they could continue that use, um, but again, could not necessarily expand uh, as that is no longer a permitted use in that district. So can you s repeat what you just said about a two-year window? What, what was that? Exactly, so yeah, so, so today, say Avis in their current space closed shop, if no one tried to use automobile rental or lease for a period of two years, it no longer could be used there as it's, not, it's a non-conforming use that has ceased its period of 
continued operation after it's become a non-conforming use. So they could use it today as they're using it. They could sell it to the next user, continue using it that way. Uh, but if it stopped for a period of two years, that use is no longer permissible as a permitted so, use. So the, those two businesses and or any businesses that come into those spaces to do the same type of business could be there in perpetuity? Yes, sir. Yeah. As long as there's not a two-year gap of non-use? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so again, that's really the full, uh, the full detail, the full actual uh, application and amended text were provided to you in your reading packets. Um, but that's the summary of the legislative uh, amendment. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. So this mall B3 district, it extends out how far? So the entirety of the mall property, uh, so El Elder Beerman, their entire lot, uh, all the way up around Macy's, back around uh, you know, Penny's, Sears, well, yeah, all of those properties are in the B3 district. Uh, then coming south onto Kings Ridge, the majority of Kings Ridge Drive is B3. Um, and then some property just to the north along 725 is B3 as well. But the majority is contained directly around uh, the mall with a couple of odds and ends B3 properties. Um, some on the west side um, over near Dayton Cincinnati Pike by the gas station up uh, the marathon on Dayton Cincinnati Pike. There's a property that's B3, but. Um, for the most part, it's pretty contained around the central mall area. Okay, thanks. Would this type of resolution also apply to like a U-Haul type business? Uh, right, so currently, uh, like a U-Haul really is not a, depending on how the definition of automobile is stretched, would not really apply today. Um, they m more would be fitting into this conditional use of the B4 for automobile, truck, boat, and marine equipment, mobile home, motorcycle, that's the broader version of kind of what that is. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have concluded the staff report. Given there is no members of the public, I don't think any members of the staff will want to come forward, so we will close the public comment period for proponents and opponents. I will make a motion to close the public hearing for zoning case 459-23. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 73-2023, a resolution to adopt a text amendment to the Miami Township Zoning Revolu res Resolution. Therefore, be it resolved, the Miami Township Board of Trustees approves the text amendment to the Miami Township Zoning Resolution under zoning case 459-23 and adopts the Zoning Commission recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. I'll make a motion to open public hearing for zoning case 458-22. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. Zoning case 458-22 is now open. The following will be the order in which this hearing will proceed. Staff will give a report. If the applicant is present, they will be given an opportunity for a presentation. All proponents or opponents will be given an opportunity to speak with a time limit of five minutes on each of the speakers. When you come forward, give your name and address for the record. The board will review the record of findings of fact requirements for this case. The board will close the public hearing and make a final determination on the findings of fact. The board will then make a motion on the resolution concerning this case. We will now hear from the staff. Mr. Carlson, have the legal requirements for this meeting been met? They have. Would you like to review your report at this time? I would. Good evening, board. Four five eight dash two three. I'm I apologize sorry. that is a typo on my on my script that it was provided for the case opening. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Snyder. It is two three. Do we need to make a new motion? Or are we good? We're good. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that correction. Uh, zoning case four five eight dash two three is a rezoning request into a plan development on behalf of Cornerstone Research Group. Uh, the request generally is to rezone about 61 acres uh, from two different zoning districts, the I-1 Industrial and the PD-3 Planned Business District, into an SPPUD, Special Purpose Plan Unit Development District, as well as review a pr preliminary development plan uh, for Cornerstone's future use of the property. 
so the point of order, uh, Cornerstone Research Group currently utilizes the existing building at 8821 Washington Church Road. Uh, they have office, research and development, manufacturing uses within the building. It's currently zoned I-1 industrial, uh, permitted use with uh, a tacked on conditional use because they do have some uh, small amounts of chemical storage for uh, their, their research and development purposes. Um, but again, they are conducting as a permitted business within the existing facility. Uh, Cornerstone Research Group has plans uh, or, or goals to uh, expand their business on site within Miami Township. Uh, part of making that a smoother process would be uh, to rezone the lands that they own into a single district, single plan development that establishes preliminary uses uh, and a site plan. So that is the request uh, to rezone the uh, two I-1 parcels uh, sort of in the direct vicinity and the two or three PD-3 parcels. Uh, into a special purpose plan unit development district. So here's an overview of the preliminary development plan. Um, the preliminary development plan establishes four different areas within the plan development, um, each of them differing slightly in their uh, proposed uses, but pr primarily because uh, there are established uses in area one and a uh, directly planned use in area two. Uh, area two I'll get into in a moment, uh, with area three then being the closest to, uh, as you can see, uh, residences along the west side. Area four, similarly having residences, uh, though in Washington Township, apartment complexes on the east side, um, limiting those to uh, office uses rather than the research, development, manufacturing use that's more centrally located within area one. So again, there was a want to uh, break up some of the use types permitted. I'll get into area two in a moment. Uh, that is the most immediate plan that Cornerstone has for the property. Uh, so we do have some of the, the specifics of area two. Uh, in creating a new plan development, as well as a preliminary development plan, specific development standards are created uh, for the district. Uh, generally, these development standards reference the existing Miami Township zoning resolution for things like building design, lighting, landscaping, parking, signage. So. Uh, again, the goal is to be similar to what our other businesses are expected to do, uh, but then there are some exceptions uh, that can be created uh, for flexibility in plan development. One of these is specific architectural creativity. Uh, the request here is that they would like to design uh, a, a very creative office building that utilizes a lot of glass features and, and different roof lines, uh, something that doesn't necessarily fit exactly into our standard district, but again, would be viewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we've also uh, increased the building uh, setback adjacent to residential areas from a typical district, again, to twice the building height. Uh, so again, if something is going to be tall, it needs to be doubly that away from buildings as to not impose on existing residences. Uh, and then finally, uh, really doubling down on special consideration to make sure that those homes are very well screened uh, from any lighting or uh, parking that would ever come as part of a future development. So again, we're establishing the zoning now. Any future devel final development plan would come before this board for a uh, specific review of these details. So then again, looking at the comprehensive plan, uh, the comprehensive plan land use review process that was established when it was adopted in 2022. Uh, this proposal very well meets all of the goals of the comprehensive plan. It's an industrial use intended for a headquarters type industrial. Again, it is a uh, potential for high employment area within the district. Uh, there's minimal new impact on surrounding land uses as again, it's I-1 today. They could develop f further, probably more impactful uses than what would be permitted in the special purpose planning and development district. Uh, as far as capacity goes, it is largely undeveloped today. Certainly is space for, for future development and is mostly pervious with existing pond area, uh, so it's not currently a large paved area. Uh, and then in terms of standards, again, not out of line with existing zoning and further promote uh, efficient and high quality development. Here's a quick look specifically at area two. Again, this was sort of the uh, impetus to bring this forward now. Uh, Cornerstone Research Group would like to expand with additional office space as well as community space for their uh, employees. They would like to have a space where they can come, sort of like a commissary or cafeteria to eat uh, you know, during work hours and have open space where they can meet. Uh, part of the reason that uh, I, I specify for their employees, uh, they are hoping to utilize existing parking uh, as to not over park. So there's not additional people coming in beyond their employees. So 
Uh, we double checked all their parking counts and it's uh, currently in line, uh, but we wanted to be clear to them. Uh, if you feel that you're bringing in other uh, groups to come meet here at any point in the future, that needs to be discussed as part of the parking uh, so they're not uh, parking in the grass. Uh, quick look, um, the goal of Cornerstone Research Group was to make this uh, facility um, beautiful. They really want uh, to, to have a nice place for their employees to be, to walk around. Uh, they have potential uh, paths across the pond. They have pathways for people to come and walk uh, while they're working, and they wanted to decorate the space to open out into the existing uh, basin and use that as a feature. Here's a quick look at their uh, building design. Again, let me see, there's a good rendering. Uh, they wanna have a nice open atrium space with uh, a lot of glass uh, and again, uh, well landscaped. Oh, apologize, that monitor turned off. Okay, it's off. So there's a quick view at their building design. Again, this will all be reviewed as part of a final development plan, but they wanted to provide this uh, to show what their vision was for a preliminary development plan. So again, going back to the full site plan, um, this uh, current potential building would be located to the north uh, area. They would utilize existing access, uh, back to, uh, utilize existing parking, and again, uh, house further expansion of their business and have a community space uh, for their employees. So that's the general uh, desire of the special purpose plan unit development. Uh, and then again, taking those other areas that currently are industrial type users or uses, uh, and uh, again, with their discussion, through discussion with Cornerstone Research Group, limiting that more to office type development, which would be better compatible with neighboring uh, residential uses. I think that is all for now. The board has any questions? I would be happy to discuss. Uh, so currently, they are by the end of this year, they'll be at about 100. They're hoping to be at 200 by the end of 2025, with hopes for future expansion beyond that. All right. At this time, the board of trustees is required, and I am sorry we would be opening up the proponents and opponents portion of the meeting, but there is no one here. Um, so with that, at this time, the Board of Trustees is required under Article 31, Section 3104 of the Miami Township Zoning Resolution to make a specific finding of fact based upon the particular evidence presented at this hearing. The fiscal officer shall now read each standard, call the roll, determine the finding of each trustee on the following standards. Mr. Klingerman. Number one, section 3104, the site will be accessible from public roads that are adequate to carry the traffic that will be imposed upon them by the proposed development standards, where only the proposed uses and development standards are to be adopted and provides for pedestrian accessibility and connectivity throughout the design. Mr. Morris, true or false? Yes, true. Mr. Culp, true, true or false? True. Section 3104B, the proposed development and or development standards adequately address issues related to compatibility with adjacent uses, environmental issues, and overall design compatibility, including lighting and landscaping, and do so in a manner that improves upon what would be achieved under the non-PD zoning standards. Mr. Morris, true or false? True. Mr. Culp, true or false? True. Section 3104C, the proposed development and or development standards are intended to produce a superior, superior design and construction that would normally occur under the non-PD zoning standards. It will not cause an undue burden on public services and facilities, including but not limited to fire and police protection. Mr. Morris, true or false? True. Mr. Culp, true or false? True. Section 3104D, the proposal is in accordance with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan. Mr. Morris, true or false? True. Mr. Culp, true or false? True. Section 3104E, 
If the project is proposed to contain non-residential uses, the conditions imposed mitigate any potential significant impacts associated with the proposal, including maintaining a minimum 50 foot distance from a retail office or other non-industrial business structure, or 100 foot distance from a manufacturing structure to a residential building outside of the planned development district with a minimum 30 foot property line setback for a retail office or other non-industrial use and 50 foot property line setback for a manufacturing use along any property lines adjacent to a residentially zoned property. Mr. Morris, true or false? True. Mr. Culp, true or false? True. I move to close the public hearing for zoning case 458-23 and find that all, is it 23? Yes? Yes. 23, okay. And find that all of the above standards were met by the evidence presented at the public hearing. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 74-2023, a resolution to adopt a zoning map amendment from the I-1 industrial district and PD-3 planned business district to the SPPUD special purpose planned unit development district under zoning case 458-23. Therefore, be it resolved, the Miami Township Board of Trustees approves the zoning map amendment and the attached Exhibit A planned development standards and Exhibit B planned or I mean preliminary plan under zoning case 458-23 and upholds the zoning commission recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Mr. Morris. Aye. Mr. Culp. Aye. We've completed the rest of the agenda. Mr. Culp, do you have any elected official comments? I do not. I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 713. Thank you all for your attendance.